Jian, and thanks everyone for um, being here uh, this evening. Uh, it's a Andrea and I, um, uh, Minister for Child Protection and Mental Health, and I have done quite a few of these uh, methamphetamine forums. It's obviously one of those issues uh, that many people in the community are concerned about. Uh, and we do have a strategy as a state government to address uh, methamphetamine usage uh, in our community. And it's, um, so the way the format usually works is um, I'll talk a little bit about the policing end of the methamphetamine problem, which is the supply end of meth. Uh, Andrea has responsibility for uh, the harm minimisation um, and the education component to try and drive down demand for the drug. Um, between the two of us, we're responsible uh, for the methamphetamine strategy for the state. Um, I would like to thank the officers from Joondla uh, Police Station who are here this evening at the back. Uh, Steve Dawson, Sergeant Brad Cutler, uh, Sergeant Glenn Ham Hamilton and also Detective Sergeant Hubbard. Thank you for being here on a Monday evening. I do appreciate you taking the time uh, to be part of the event and obviously when we get to questions uh, there may be um, some information that will be of use to the police officers from that Joondla uh, Police uh, uh, Station. Now to talk a little bit more about uh, methamphetamine, um, in Western Australia we have doubled the usage rate of methamphetamine to any other state in, in Australia, doubled the average net, um, rate of usage. We know that this is true uh, from a number of things, uh, a number of initiatives that we've taken. There's a national household survey where people are called and asked the question about methamphetamine use. Uh, and 3.8% of our population say that they have used meth in the last 12 months. That's uh, as opposed to 1.8% of the population generally across Australia. We don't fully understand the reasons for the high meth use in the state, but the fact that we've had a lot of money washing through our community uh, probably goes part way to explaining why that drug has been the drug of choice for Western Australians. Um, the other way that we, we know that the usage rate is around about what people have told us is that we've also done testing of our sewerage system, the Blackwater um, sewerage testing, and that has shown us that, that when we calculate back the, the um, metabolites that are uh, the result of methamphetamine uh, being, used, uh, being metabolised by our system, we can calculate that back to what we know is the concentration of meth being sold on the street and the usage rate comes in at around about that 3.8% usage rate. So um, there are a few things we need to do about that obviously. Um, police have responsibility for blocking the supply of meth and for trying to interrupt the distribution networks. They've been very successful at doing that. <laughs> Uh, in fact, we've had over 700 kilograms of methamphetamine seized in the last 12 months, including the two biggest seizures of all time, one in September last year of 315 kilograms and one in May of this year of 185 kilograms. Now, the reason um, uh, meth is being sold here, uh, it, increasingly we're not having it manufactured here in Clan Lakes. It's coming from... Uh, across our shores from Asia. Uh, one kilogram of meth can be purchased for about six and a half thousand dollars and can be sold on the streets of Perth for anywhere up to a million dollars. So there's massive profits to be made in selling this drug to vulnerable people in our community uh, and that's why uh, it's very important that we try and target those drug dealers. We're not going to get ahead of the problem while there's still people who want to purchase the drug because with money like that to be made, if there are people demanding the drug, there are going to be vendors who want to sell it. So we have to work on driving down demand for the drug if we're going to get on top of the problem. Now, police have been very effective, um, as I said, in the work they do. They've executed in the last, uh, up to August this year, 560 search warrants. Uh, they have, um, taken into custody 1,200 offenders and they've been charged with over 5,000 offences. So um, it, it's, it, it's a big job when you have a look at those numbers. Uh, and when we look at the seizures of methamphetamine, what we're finding is that even with the big seizures, we're not seeing um, a subsequent increase in the cost of the drug at street level, which means there's ample supply coming through. 
So one of the initiatives we have is with the federal government. We have a joint organised crime task force. The federal government have been very good at giving us some resources. So out at um, the Australian Federal Police Building near the airport, we have co-located team members from the Australian Federal Police, the Australian Crime Commission, um, Austrac, who are the people who track the big money transactions, um, WA Police and Customs and Border Protection. Um, they work together. Uh, the way that that works is actually very effective. What they've done is co-located um, individuals from each of those agencies with their databases in the one location. And just by putting those people together, they basically cross-referenced their databases and found 600 common red flags. And they started going to work on those. Uh, and that's how they've managed to have some success with those big seizures. Um, the other part of that, of our strategy, is around what our local police do. So we have meth teams who work on um, targeting the transport hubs, um, the trucks, the airports, you know, some of those distribution networks. We have, um, we have a meth desk. Um, so the meth desk is, uh, calls in all of the intelligence um, that's gathered by the local policing teams, the calls to crime stoppers, the calls to 131444, and they have analysts in there who pull the information together and try to um, then link up uh, an operation. We have the local policing teams that deal with um, the, the dealers that some of you might be aware of, uh, the drug house on the, on the street, for example. Uh, and we really need the cooperation of the community if we're going to be helping um, shut down those places and take those individuals into custody. Um, people think that if you make one phone call to the police about those houses that it's enough. Um, unfortunately, it, it takes some time for police to gather up all of the required information that they're going to need to satisfy a court, to give them a search warrant. And then we want to make sure we've got all of the information available so that when the search warrant is executed, it's likely to be executed at a time where you've got the drug dealers there with the drugs so that they can actually get charged with an offence for it with a significant amount of uh, drugs in their possession and cash, etc. And then it makes that entire operation worthwhile and we can charge that drug dealer with a significant offence that brings with it a larger penalty. So um, that's, I, I encourage you to continue to cooperate with police if you've been calling in. Um, the other... Um, The other part of the um, uh, picture is clan labs. Now, we're seeing a reduction in the number of clan labs that uh, police have discovered simply because the drug's so cheap to come in from Asia. Um, it's, we had about 84 clan labs uh, that were discovered by police and dismantled in 2014. And so far this year, there's been around 35 clan labs, so significant reduction. Uh, but clan labs are still an area of focus for police. There are still some people who are cooking up their own drugs at home, and obviously they're very high risk to have in our community. Um, to help police with the job that they're doing in, drop, in stopping the supply of meth, we've also have brought in, um, I brought in new legislation around our, our meth transit routes. So basically what we've enabled with the legislation is for those areas where we suspect that methamphetamine is being transported, like for instance the air highway coming from the east coast, Great Northern Highway, we can declare a, a section of that road uh, to be a, a suspected meth transit route. And in doing that, that then enables us to stop and search every vehicle that goes through that checkpoint. And in doing that, uh, we can use drug dogs, um, drug detection equipment, and execute the search. If we get a positive read for methamphetamine, obviously we can then seize um, whatever that package is or, and then uh, go further with prosecutions for that person who's transporting meth. Currently, or prior to that legislation, police had to have a search warrant in order to search a vehicle. Uh, so that becomes uh, a lot more problematic and this, uh, this will give police a really good tool. The other part of that um, legislation will allow us to declare remote Aboriginal communities, for example, to be a suspected um, transit route. So we'll be able to stop every vehicle going into those remote communities that are now being targeted by drug dealers 
uh, and stop and search every vehicle and take methamphetamine and if it's a dry community, also alcohol um, out of the possession of those people who are trying to target those vulnerable communities. The third part of the legislation is around um, the couriers. So DHL and Toll IPEG actually came to us and said, we are really worried that we are inadvertently drug couriers. We take a sealed parcel, uh, it gets delivered to us, we take it from A to B, we, and we're not allowed to open it. We know we must be transporting drugs, but we're powerless to actually do anything about it. So that um, drug transit route legislation allows police to go into any of those distribution hubs for Toll IPEG or DHL or any of those big companies and run our drug, drug dogs and our drug detection equipment over those parcels and out of that, you know, obviously then we have a sender, we have a receiver, we have a parcel with drugs in it and we can start to do some work on, you know, where those, two, those individuals sit within the distribution network. So we'll keep looking at um, if we need better legislation, if we need to give police more tools, we'll do that. Uh, but that's, that's the job that we've got at the moment and that's some of the initiatives we've put in place. Um, just to, before I sit down, I'll give you a snapshot of, um, you know, 3.8% usage, it sounds, it is a really high number. However, the methamphetamine users that we have, 25% um, of them are users who need the drug every day and that drives their existence. And they're the people who are doing uh, the break and eaters, uh, the car thefts, they're holding up service stations, they're doing all of those sorts of things to fund their habit. 75% of our users are what they call recreational users. Uh, and this is, this is the group that I'm probably most concerned about in lots of ways. They come home from work on a Friday, and they use the drug on a Friday night and Saturday night so that they can stay out partying all night. Then they spend Sunday getting it out of their system and they go back to work on Monday and they think they've got that under control. Uh, but for those people, they're really only one crisis away from slipping into the 25% of users who have a really serious problem. So you know, we need to be getting the message out to both those groups uh, as to you know, the dangers of long-term methamphetamine use because that recreational use is still causing brain damage to those individuals and it will have a long-term health disbenefit to them even if they manage not to become um, someone who's driven to take the drug every day. So we've got a big job on our hands. We resource police as uh, well to do it. Uh, in fact, I think police were the only agency to manage to get a budget increase uh, this year in the, in the economic climate that we're in. Uh, but, and I do appreciate the work that they do, as I'm sure all of you will too. Now I'll hand over to Andrea to talk about um, education, harm reduction and the demand end, uh, and then we'll go to questions. Thanks. And look, I'm very pleased to just talk from the other perspective of uh, dealing with meth, and that's from our point of view. Our first priority at all times is for people not to get taken up in the first place. That's our first priority, and that's where we see a significant focus of what we do, uh, particularly, and that will start with school children. We start there because we'll give them the facts. You know, we're in teacher at school to get information and facts. We will do that, but we'll make, also make sure that in the programs that are being run through the schools, that they have some, preferably someone who's been through not too much older than them about how they got into it, what happened. So there'll be work done in all the schools to make sure that students understand the information, the knowledge, but also how to deal with it. Because what I want to be able to make sure is that every young person who, and I'm going to say probably eventually, Someone will say to them, come on, one won't hurt. One of these won't hurt, it'll make you feel good. I want to know that that person has the confidence in themselves, in their ability, and their self-worth to be able to say, no thanks, that's not for me, I'm not into that. But then also know that that person, some of that supposed friend's going to come back very quickly and say, come on, don't be silly, everyone's doing it, you're going to look silly, don't I? go through all that but still that person have the self-confidence to be able to say, no thanks, I'm not into that. And basically then realise that those people that they're hanging around with probably aren't the best of friends anyway. So we need to get to that point in time. So it's not just about the knowledge, it's about the person feeling strong enough in themselves 
and that they're more important than going down that track. So there's a lot of work being done in the schools and we've put additional funds into that because there's always been a drug education program. We're now expanding that. We're also expanding that same, it's called SIDERA, School Drug Education Road Aware Program. We're uh, making, expanding that so that we give professional development to the staff, to the teachers. We give um, community forums and also those for parents. Because one of the big things that I hear over and over again is we don't know what to do. Parents and loved ones are saying we don't know what to do, we don't know where to go. So from that point of view, we want to equip those people as well within that. Now you're going to say, but I don't see any of these prevention programs, I don't see where these things are going. Can I just say, what we're, we're using social media very well at the moment. Because we could spend a lot of money on campaigns that really aren't going to impact on a lot of people. So for young people, if they book a ticket to go to a concert, invariably you've got to give an email address, an email or something like that, and you'll f they will find that they'll be getting targeted messages about um, this, this campaign and others. So it is, it is occurring, it is happening, but you may not be on that radar. So don't feel bad if you haven't seen anything. On the other hand, um, we are putting a, a few show, um, campaigns back on TV and in different areas, and I think there was a complaint, someone in the paper today said those men, um, ads are too violent, that's not going to make a difference. One thing I want to say very clearly here is we're dealing with people. No person is the same, and there isn't a standard approach across the board. So there are the, um, the ads on TV that will come up and basically show how meth actually unravels your life. As Lisa just said, you could be one step away from getting into that crisis point. We want people to understand that because quite often people, the recreational type, you say, I'm in control, everything's fine, but invariably they won't be fine. So we just want to help people understand that you might think you're okay, you're covering it all right, but it won't take long before you really are in a spot. So we do our campaigns differently, we do our targeting differently, and we will use social media as much as we can, because that's the media that young people are using. In terms of how we help people, we have, once again, a range of treatment options. A range of treatment options. We need to know, or we want to make sure that people can get access to a service when they choose to, because preferably we want people to choose to go into some form of treatment. Rehabilitation beds are at one end, right back at the beginning. We want people to access as soon as they can. <coughs> and the idea we would prefer is work that is currently being done out in your community, in community treatment. So you may be surprised at how many people who are currently holding down a very good job. who just happen to go off for their treatment for addiction during the week, nights, other places, and they carry on. That's what we like. As people tend to become more addicted and their lives start to uh, go out of control, then we need to have more dedicated, focused rehabilitation services. And I'd like to acknowledge Malcolm Smith here today as well. Malcolm's the head of Teen Challenge, which is a very effective uh, rehabilitation service for young people based out of their sprints, and I have been down there. So there are a range of those options that are there. They aren't always in your backyard. A lot of people say, I need them right here. But quite often, a lot of people who want to go into a rehabilitation treatment program actually want to get right away. They want to get right away from their community because often within their community are the things that have brought them to the point they're at. So it is handy sometimes for a person to leave their community go away for rehabilitation and that can vary the amount of time that it might take a person depending on what what position they're at in terms of their addiction and also that person what other issues that person's dealing with because we just don't deal with the physical addiction we've got to make sure when that person leaves that rehabilitation process they've actually got the support systems around them and that includes their family and these loved ones and hopefully new friends. It also means that that person has to be strong enough for when they go back into the community 
and any drug addict will tell you when they come out of rehabilitation, the first person to make contact with them will be their old friends. They'll be right there waiting for them and they won't let them, well, they'll try very hard not to let them go. So when a person does return to their community life, that support system around the person and the strength, the inner strength of that person is absolutely critical to achieve that success. And what is great is that a lot of those services keep in touch with their people all the time anyway, and that is critical. One of the things that um, listening to a number of people in the community have said, and it's normally parents and loved ones, that they are would really like a situation where they could force their son or daughter or loved one to go into treatment. It's a very difficult process to do, but we, I listened to what people were saying, and we have, we are currently um, drafting legislation that we call a compulsory alcohol and drug treatment legislation, so that if someone really is at a point where they're going to do a lot of damage to themselves or someone in the community, uh, one step away from getting into the criminal justice system, then we will have some legislation that if we go through some very strict criteria and referral pathways, because we don't want anyone just to see a little bit of respite going on here for a little while, then that legislation will be out for public comment uh, later this year, I'm hoping about early December. So that would be, once again, the last resort. So I said, well, I want a range of treatment services so that there is a, a treatment service that best suits the person at their particular point in time. <coughs> One of the other things that um, has come out loud and clearly, as I said along the way, is many people said we didn't know where to go. And I've got to be honest, when I became the Minister for Mental Health and Drugs and Alcohol do, does come into mental health, that I sat in my office and Googled <coughs> help for ice addiction in Perth. <coughs> and not much came up. And yet I'd just been briefed on all the services that are out there. So I said, well, we're not getting the message out. And people want to know, and they want to know 24 hours a day, because one thing that happens, crises don't happen between 9 and 5. Crises happen after hours. So we have now a meth helpline, and I have got some flyers on the desk. They're blue. Um, if you'd like to take one of those, there's, there's little ones, big ones, and little size ones. The meth helpline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't have to be an addict to call it. You can be a family member, you can be a loved one. And when, you, when they pick up the phone and they are trained counsellors and people who are professional, particularly in, with meth addiction, then they can, they'll direct you to the, the person you are best to speak with and then you can get some advice and support on what you should do next. So that is out there and we're, I must tell you the number, it's 1800 874 878, but it said those numbers are on the table. We had over 500 calls to that service in the first three weeks, and it was people who were genuinely interested to find out what they should do. There was a large number of family members, but we also did have um, people who had an addiction or felt that they were becoming more addicted than they planned to be. So that is out there. We've also, um, in fact, tomorrow I'll be announcing that we do have some more additional rehabilitation beds uh, becoming available by the start of the year. We've been put extra training for nurses and professionals in emergency departments. We've put some training in for people who perhaps are security officers or event organisers where they often have to come across people who may be in a, a situation where you can tell something's not right. So we put giving those people training as well. So what we're trying to do is make sure that more people understand what's going on and know how to deal with it. The key word, I think, in any situation that you may ever find yourself in uh, with someone who is under a meth addiction is to de-escalate the problem. Don't be aggressive, don't, be, don't start shouting what it was. It's all about de-escalation, calming down, settling down, but there's mental health first training, there's all sorts of things that we will do. We've also now got a specialist meth clinic in the city, and that has, once again, doctors, um, psychiatrists, nurses, who are, have a specialist area in meth addiction. 
So we're focusing on it. We do believe we, can, we are making a difference. And by people talking about it and knowing about it, when it's not under the carpet. It's open, it's out there. We want to make sure that we tackle this. We want to make sure that we provide a service and support system for the community because they are critical because invariably somebody knows somebody who's had a family member who's been caught up in it and I can say exactly that in my street. A very lovely family went through uh, that whole process. In fact, the son ended up down in Esperance with Malcolm and he is a fine young man and doing exceptionally well. So you can come out of it, you can go through it and you can recover fully. But it does take time and it does need good support. Families and support systems are critical in all this. And I can't emphasise that as much. Don't give up on your loved one. Don't give them money if they ask for it. Because you know, even though they'll say they want to go and put petrol in the car, they won't. Don't say they want to go and buy some food, because they won't. Um, don't give them money. Buy the food, fill the car up, whatever you need to do. It is your loved one, but unfortunately they're, they're not in control. And you are very special to them. They don't always show up during these sorts of times. I'm going, the other one I've got on the table is just some emergency contact numbers. But there are also there's some uh, <coughs> services in Joomla that if you wanted to know more about them as well, that's also on the table as you walk out tonight. But I think we'd better open up for some questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um,